instead of developing the model through first principles by conservation of mass, energy, momentum, what have you, um, we're going to do this. We're going to collect data by doing a set of experiments. We're going to move an input around. So we're interested in building a, a, a simple, typically, model between some input, which we call U, and some output, which we call Y. I'm not sure why this thing's moving around. Um, and we're going to do that by moving the input around, as I explained last time. If we don't excite the system, we won't get any in interesting information out of it. And then from this information of the input to the output, we're going to build a model. We're going to build transfer function models directly from the data. Okay? And this will be an alternative for processes that are either complex or don't, just don't justify the effort of doing any detailed modeling. Okay. So last time we went through first a first order system, and I'll, maybe I'll just review that real quick. The idea here was that <coughs> we know that a first order system exhibits a response that to a step input change that looks like this. Okay. Right. We already derived that last time, and we know what that looks like. At least we should know what that looks like. <coughs> that looks like this. Your time. <coughs> Got there would be a function of the time constant. So if we saw a response that looks like that in our data, we'd be tempted to try to fit a model to the data that looks like this or equivalently like this with off the main time domain. Okay. Last time I went over how to do this. So the first thing you can do is figure out the gain of the process, the k here, right? By taking how much the output change from one steady state to another and divide by how much you change the input. So the idea is that when you did this experiment, you implemented some input change, a step change, and that's called delta u. And then this is called delta y. And for all methods we talk about, this is how you find the gain. Take the amount of the output change. Steady state divided by the amount of input change. That's how you always find the gain. It never changes. Okay? All right. Um, and then I told you there's two ways to find the time constant. The bad way, which involves finding a tangent, right, uh, which we didn't like, and then a more sensible way. And the more sensible way was this. So here's the plot of the response of the system. Like so obviously, this doesn't look like real data because there's no noise, but just to make it simple. We plotted y divided by cam, so it, it asymptotically approaches 1 instead of cam, and we scaled time by tau, just for simplicity. And if you evaluate the solution of this equation for um, t equal tau, you'll find that the output reaches 63 to 80 percent of its final value at when t equals tau. So that means if you can find when the output has reached 63 percent of its final value, you can conclude that time is tau. So you just look at the response curve, find when it's 63% complete, and the, the time that that occurs is half. Okay? So that's the, that's the best way to find tau for a first order system. I'm going to do a little example. Okay. Um, and then we move to what if the, what if the system seems to exhibit uh, a time delay, but it's still first order. So in that case, Here's the output. It might look something like this. You change the input right at that point. Nothing happened for a while. And then it looks first order like this. Okay? So there's a discernible time delay there. So now you want to use a model that looks like this. Okay? It has a gain. It has a time constant. Now it has this delay theta. Okay? And I gave you, I think I told you this method. Yeah, it's the last thing we did, I believe. Is you come here and you do the following. You find when the response is 35% um, complete, 35.3. <coughs> Obviously, I'm not a good drawer. Um, I never like my drawings, but okay. so maybe that's that right, right there. Okay. And then you find when it's 85% complete. Uh, that's that. 
so this thing is called T35, and this thing is called T85. Okay. Now, in order, if you, if you, there's a little uh, nuance here. So find these times with the time delay removed. That means the time where the output starts changing, right there, is where you consider time equals zero. Okay. So that means this distance here okay, is the T35, and then this distance here is the T85. You just have to consider the time where the output starts changing as time equals zero. Right? So there's T35, there's T85. And then you can use these uh, magical equations here. Once you have those times, you can plug them into this equation, you find the theta and the, and the time constant. And you already know what the gain is, because as usual, you find it you make how much the output change. So this provides a simple way to find the parameters of the model. And you can see that you're seeing a trend here. And that's that you get the data, and then you find points on the data. You find points using the response curve, and then you find the parameters from those points. Okay. If the system is first order, without a time delay, you only need one point when it's 63% complete. Without the time delay, you need two points when it's 35 to 85% complete. All right? Uh, okay. So now let's say we have this. So why would we have this? Well, because we did a step change that looks like that. And perhaps we got a response that looked like this. Okay. So we said, oh, that doesn't look first order. Okay. It looks higher order, also known as second order or higher. And so the most general type of transfer function that we might consider is one that looks like this. We have a time delay, potentially. We have a gain, as usual. And then we have the parameters that we talked about for a second order system, the time <coughs> constant and the damping coefficient. And so if you saw a data like this, this would correspond to a system with a damping coefficient between 0 and 1. And we'll talk about that. Okay. But so we also said this is the most general form of a second order system we can have. Potentially, that you can factor this denominator. Right? You can factor it as squiggly as equal to 1 or greater. Perhaps not, but this is the most general form. Okay. All right, so let's say that we have reasonably, this is a, a reasonable form for the model. Why? Because we saw, we looked at the data and it looks like this, potentially, or something like that. Okay. And we know a first order system is not going to work. Then we can use the method explained here. Okay. First thing it says is estimate data from the step response. <coughs> so if you change the input right there, and then you said, well, it looks like the output starts changing right there, and then this amount right there is your estimate of the time delay. Okay. Right, theta is how long it takes the output to respond, start responding once the input has been changed. So if you change the input time equals zero, let's say, and the output starts changing here, that's theta. All right. Then you come up here, and I bet I'm going to want to redraw this picture. I never like the pictures once I realize what I need to do with them. Let me redraw this. In fact, this is what I'm going to draw it um, without an oscillation, because you don't necessarily have to have an oscillation for it to be second order. All right, so it says find two times t20 and t60 now. So you come up here and you find when it's 20% complete. I don't know, maybe that's there. That's that time right there. And then what's the other time? 60% complete. So there's 20 and I don't know, 60 maybe is up here. And then again, you have to use, you have to specify, well, you have to remove the time delay from when you compute these times. So. So as far as you're concerned, this is time zero right here. Okay. And so now I've drawn this badly, of course. But that distance between that line and that line, where, where the system starts responding and where you found those 20 cent for 20 percent complete is the T20. And then from that time equals zero to that point is T60. Okay? 
So I'm just I'm just finding the times when it's 20% complete and 60% complete at a mode to time delay. Then you use this graph. So you come over here and you say, okay, I'm going to take the T20, I'm going to take the T60, I'm going to divide the two. It's obviously going to be a number less than one. So you, hopefully it's in this range. If it's not in this range, you can't use this method, okay? So let's say it's 0.4. And you come up here and you say, ah, oh, there's the value of squiggly. You have to be careful because this is a logarithmic scale, and I can't read logarithmic scales that great. But if someone asks me, what is that value right there because it's logarithmic scale, I might say, I don't know, 1.2. I don't know. That's my best guess. Okay. Then I come up to point 0.4 here, find this point here. This is T60 divided by tau. You know T60, so from that you can compute tau. And if someone asks me what that number was, I don't know, slightly greater than 2. I know T60, so I can compute tau. If you end up with a case where your T20 divided by T60 is not on this graph, then you can't do this. You can't use this. Okay. Tough, tough break. You can see that the system is going to be underdamped, meaning you're going to get a squiggly less than 1 if this, if this ratio is relatively large. <coughs> Less than one. Yeah? Do you know if and where that graph is in the book? Uh, no, do you think it's not in the book? I mean, I assume it will be. It may not be. Because I've prepared the slide usually from the older versions of the book. I would assume that's still in there. Um, I, would, I would have to look. At this point, I have to admit I don't look at the book a lot because I, I, once I prepare the notes from the book, I don't usually look at it too much anymore. Yeah? Where does the percents come from? Yeah, I don't really say the underlying basis of this, but it comes from taking these type of models and trying to come up with a general method that allows you to conclude what the parameter values are from the two points off the response curve. I don't know actually the underlying approach, but my guess is it's based on kind of optimizing the difference between the response and the model and the actual data set, and then you come up with a method, but I'm not totally sure. Okay. So at this point, it's a little bit like baking a cake, right? You don't ask why these are the ingredients. They simply are. <laughs> Proceed, all right? So that means I could give you a response curve that looks like this, okay? And then, in principle, you could apply this method and end up with a model like that, right? You get the gain by that ratio as usual. You get the time delay by looking at the graph, and, the <coughs> and you get the, the talent as quickly as using this graph here, all right? All right. So here's a example. So let's say someone gives you this data set. Okay, so someone did a step change. Right? The step change to the input, and this is the corresponding output change as a function of time. As usual, they scale the output by Km, right? K is the standard process M is the amount you change the input. And you, you have this data. The first thing you should conclude here is that this is not a first-order system. How do I know that? Because I, I can see by what, how it behaves here. If it was first order, it would go like this. The fact it's got kind of a curvature there tells you it's higher order than first order. And the only thing that we think about higher order than first order is second order. So we would be tempted to use a second order model for this. Because we think a first order wouldn't fit. Because there's no way for a first order model to look like that. Okay. The higher order the system is, the more it'll tend to look like it. I think I do this before, but I'm rather. You understand the key thing in doing this empirical modeling is to look at the data and have some idea what type of model might fit the data. If you can't do that, then you have no chance. So let's say here's I'm finding y versus time, and let's say first order looks like this. Okay. Then second order might look like that. And as the system gets higher and higher order, it looks more and more like that. Okay? That's a really high order system. I don't know why, but it's really high order. So we determine this by looking at the behavior down there. If it, if it has curvature kind of like this, then it's higher order. That's why I know I should try a second order model, and the first order model is not going to work well. All right, so I try a second order model. And okay, that's my reasoning there. Now I. So what I did here is I changed the input here, and now I say, is there a time delay? 
right? That's the next thing I have to decide. Is there a time delay? Um, not really. You know? I mean, it, 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 it changes slowly here because that's the nature of the second order system. It doesn't change that quickly at the very beginning. If there is a time delay, it's really small. You know, so it'd be negligible anyway. But my conclusion looking at that is I don't need to worry about there being a time delay. All right. So that's cool. So now I just need to, so that means I'm proposing a model that looks like, well, I will write it instead of going back. You understand? 
the real system is certainly more complex than this. It's just what we think is the simplest model of the data. So there's going to be an inherent mismatch between our model and the, and the, and the process. The other thing is obviously picking these values is rather an exact science. So we don't expect, expect the model to be perfect. And this is the kind of thing you should always do in lab if you do some kind of modeling, which is common on some of the experiments. Of course, let me see if I can go over. So here's the data. You know, maybe it looks something like that. It doesn't look anything like that. <laughs> Whatever. All right, let me try again. You think if you saw a graph there, you could somewhat use it. How about that? That looks a little closer. OK, so there's the, there's the data. And so it might be common that your model might, you know, you get the idea it's not going to be perfect. If someone said, is that a good model? I'd say that's a real good model. <coughs> like it captures all the basic features. It has pretty much the same gain, same dynamics. You shouldn't have these waves, right? I can't just, I just can't draw. Um, it, it's, it's quite close. It should be a very good model. Anything you want to do with this model, like design controller, should work really well. Sometimes I have people, because whenever there's a control experiment, especially in the second semester of lab, I get people sending me emails saying, we finally enjoy talking to you. Okay. And so, then they come with a model that looks like this. I'm like, well, that's not that good. They're like, why? And I said, it's nowhere close to the data. So, you, anytime you build a model from a data set, you should have a step where you simulate the model, compare it to the data, and see if it's, if it's good. It should be. If you, but you have to understand, if you pick the wrong structure of the model, it's guaranteed to be bad. The model is guaranteed the prediction will be really bad. Okay. So if I pick this to be first order, for example, I can guarantee it wouldn't fit the data right down there. The model can't do that. All right. So this is pretty simple. Let's say you have an integrating system. The most famous and common integrating system in the world is a, is a storage tank. You put fluid into the tank, you withdraw fluid from the tank. The level remains constant if the flow in and flow out are the same. If not, then you call it the integrating system because the level in the tank is the integral of the difference in the two flows over time. Okay. We've talked about this before. That's a model of an integrator. It's a pure integrator. Okay, no time delay, nothing else. Okay, so this input might be the flow into the tank, and then this thing might be the level in the tank. And so you want to know if I change the flow in the tank, so let's say you do an experiment. Initially, the two flows are balanced, the level's constant. Now you increase the flow into the tank. Well, the level's going to go up. Okay. So what do you do? You want to figure out what that K value is. So here's, let's say, Y versus time. At time equals zero, you increase the inlet flow. Okay. The level goes like that. <coughs> they stop the experiment, but you better stop sometime. Otherwise, the tank will overflow. So it's pretty easy to find the uh, value of k. So here's the reasoning. We know that the, the solution of that model to a step input change is this. Okay. It goes up like a ramp, and the slope is k times f. So what I've done here is just written this at two different times, right? So the value of the level, let's say at time t2, is just km times t2, and the same thing for time t1, just subtract these two. This is going to make it easy for me to find the k, or at least easy to explain. But if this is true for any time, then that equation is true for two pico times. I'm subtracting them. So all I have to do here is pick two times. Let's call it T1, and in principle, it doesn't matter what two times they are, T2. Then I get corresponding value of Y1 and Y2. I use this equation, solve it for K. You get that. You know how much you change the input, that's M. You know the Y values, you know the time values, you want to calculate the K. Okay. Now, obviously, if the, It'd be smart to pick these two values like reasonably far apart because the real level is liable to look more like this, right? Noisy. 
And so it'd be a really bad idea to take two points that are really close together. And it's just common sense, right? So you pick them sufficiently <coughs> far apart, you should be able to compensate for the effects of noise and get decay. So it's really, it's that's really easy to do. All right. So the final comment, I won't talk much about this, is that because um, we don't have time to do this in any meaningful way, so I didn't even try. In MATLAB, um, and I don't, I think this is something you don't get with the student version, maybe that's another reason you don't do it, maybe it's not have time. They have a toolbox, okay, that does all these kind of calculations for you. This, this should, I hope, when you look at this, this should feel archaic, you know, like, God, is that, is that the current state of the art in finding the parameters you need? Look at the graph and the the value. The answer is no. Um, there's a whole field that's been developed under development for uh, 50 years of trying to find models from data. It's called system identification or process identification or empirical modeling, whatever you want to call it. And MATLAB has a toolbox. You understand the, the MATLAB business model, right? Build different toolboxes and sell them separately and make money. Um, I, when you buy the student version, it's a really good deal. I think for $99, you get all the toolboxes we use and other ones. But I think this happens to be one you don't actually get. But this toolbox allows you to do all this analysis work in a very systematic way. Okay. You can uh, analyze data, you can import it, manipulate it, analyze it, fit it to models, plot it. Um, you can both do state space models, which means models in the time domain or transfer function models. Um, you can do something like compute confidence intervals. You remember when we did statistics, we talked about confidence intervals. So if you had a parameter of a distribution, like the mean, the confidence interval mattered, right? Because if the confidence interval was really large, it meant you had no confidence in the value you just found. Okay. Same thing with, with k. Like using these techniques, you would find the gain k, and you might find it's, let's say, 10 plus or minus 12. If that was the case, you'd like, I have no idea what the gain is. Because right. I don't even know if it's positive or negative. So the, these parameter confidence intervals can be very useful because they give you an idea about what uh, you're not confident in and also provide an ability. Like, if you are not confident in this ability, that suggests maybe you should do more experiments to try to reduce that confidence interval to some manageable level. Okay. <coughs> so lots of things. It's a great tool. We don't have time to talk about it, but I just didn't want, you, I just didn't want to leave you with the idea that uh, there isn't something more <laughs> in this field, but we have a lot of time to talk about it. All right. So that's that one. So that that represents the official end of part one of the course. Okay. Part one of the course is all about transfer functions, right? Take a model, find a transfer function, subject it to an input change, compute the response. That's the main thing you need to know for the first exam. And that's why I scheduled the first exam so early, because at this point I decided I was ready to give the first exam right now. But since you guys want to move back, I probably will have a little bit of material on what I'm going to talk about the next week, but the focus is going to be on what you already saw. So there would be a mass accident. Uh, all right, so now we're transitioning to the second part of the course. The first part is modeling, dynamics, transfer function. The second part of the course is introduction to control, if you will. And the third part of the course is more advanced control even though it's not that advanced, but more advanced. So what I hope to do in this particular lecture is introduce to you more details as I did the very first day uh, about what is a feedback controller. So I'll introduce the basic idea, talk about um, so-called control modes. So when you guys go to the lab, you've been in the lab already, right? I've seen you dressed up sometimes, either doing interviews or lab presentations. And you may have had one of the experiments, like the heat exchange experiment or the pH experiment. Are they running the pH experiment at this point? No. No. Do you know why? I mean, not that they need to explain to you. I just wonder. That's a great experiment. I designed it, and they never, they only never, only never use it until the second semester, which I don't quite understand. But okay, fine. Um, so if you've encountered one of the experiments with control, you might have seen. They have feedback controllers, they're usually called PID controllers. I'm going to use these proportional angle derivative controllers. So that's what I'm going to introduce here when I talk about basic control modes. I'll talk about, just like we have responses for open loop systems. By open loop, I should tell you the terminology. Open loop means a system without control. Okay, closed loop means the system connected up to a controller. 
we've been focused and you could argue obsessed with open loop responses. Like, well, how does this process respond to some certain change in the input? Uh, at some point soon, we're going to be worried about how systems with controllers respond to changes in inputs, and also called closed loop responses. And then I'll end, I don't know if I'll get this far, and I'll end with a little simulation example. All right. So this is the basic schematic taken from the book about how a controller works, a feedback controller. Okay. So first of all, we need a measurement. Okay. So this is a measurement of the thing you want to control. So if you want to control the level in a tank, you need a measurement of the level in the tank. Okay. That's what this represents. Why is the output M indicates it's the measurement. Okay. Hopefully you guys know enough about measurement technology to know that the measured value isn't usually the same as the actual value because the, me the measurement devices are not perfect. And you never know the true value, because the only way you know is from the measurement. It's not correct. Okay. Hopefully it's good enough that things work. Um, remember the video I showed you the first part of the class where they were measuring <coughs> the level in the tower? That was really not good. Okay. Okay, so you need this. This is what the measurement of the output is that you want to control. This is the so-called set point. This is what you'd like the level to be. You specify that. That's your choice. <coughs> The controller does a calculation given this information. That's what we're going to be talking about is what calculation is performed. <coughs> and then it sends a signal to the control valve, usually the control valve. It's, it's, it's a thing that actuates. It changes the manipulated variable. 95% of the time it's control valve. Occasionally it might be something else. Here's the most common controller in, in the world, or at least in the process control world, flow controller. If you go into a plant, every stream will have a flow controller on it. And um, in a typical plant, there'll be hundreds, several hundred flow controllers, I would say. And if you were to be a control engineer in a plant, like let's say ExxonMobil, they divide up. So here's how it works, right? They divide up the plant into different sections. They put a process engineer on the plant, and then they put a control engineer on the plant. So you might be responsible for the separations part of the plant. Right. Stuff comes out of the reactor, has to be separated. You're the control engineer. And they will allocate, in some sense, your software will be determined by how many controllers you're responsible for. It might be 75 or something. It's a, it's a measure of the scope of how big the pro part of the process you're, you're dealing with is. OK, so how does this flow controller work? You have flow. We're talking about liquid flow at this point. Liquid flowing down <coughs> the pipe. So what are we going to do? We want to control the flow going somewhere else. <coughs> so we're going to measure the flow, with the flow measurement. We're going to send that information to a controller, although not shown in any of the schematics you're going to see in the future. Implicit in this is there's a set point that we're, we're specifying. It's what we want the flow to be like that, not shown. <coughs> it does a calculation, and then it changes the position of this valve accordingly. If you want more flow, it opens the valve up. If you want less flow, it closes the valve down. It doesn't do this. It's not an on-off controller, right? It's not like the valve is always open or always shut. It determines how much the valve should be open or closed in order to get the desired flow. All right. And these kind of controllers, like I said, are you'll see them everywhere. You'll see them throughout the whole course. All right. So text up there, I don't think, says anything more than I've actually said, except that you're going to see this term air as we talk about control, and it is this. So the air is defined to be the difference between